Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. I do hope you're having a good day. Uh, yes, today's podcast, which is podcast number 19, is with a great friend of mine, Steve Ball. Uh, the reason why we do this podcast is he's recently launching a comic uh, with a team uh, called The 77. Uh, has, uh, how can I say, it's an anthology comic which has connections to uh, basically, uh, well, not connections to, but it's taken its sort of inspiration from uh, 2000 AD. Uh, we talked about the new comics and a number of different things as well. But yes, uh, please enjoy the podcast, which was with Steve Ball. A uh, terrific guy. I've known him for whew, since I was uh, a teenager uh, <laughs> here in good old London town. Please enjoy the podcast. Let me know what you think. Uh, yeah, throw Steve some support. And yeah, much love. Anyway, thank you very much. Peace. Haha. <laughs> okay. Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors. Wherever you are in the world, I do hope you're having a good day. Uh, this is podcast number 19, I believe. If it's not 19, it's number 20. I have my good friend for many years. I've known him since I was a scrotty nosed teenager up until like a middle aged man. Uh, his name is Steve. Uh, Steve Ball to others, but he has been a very busy chap indeed. And recently, I'm quite like right out of the blue, he has launched himself, is in the midst of launching a new comic. Steve, how are you doing, my friend? How is things? I'm okay, mate. Yes, uh, as you say, it's been a long time over 30 years, me and you, Miwa. Yes, yes. <laughs> I think I was 14 when I first met you. Yeah, 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 exactly, right? So I'm a little bit older, what am I, a year older than you, I think? So, what are you now? I'm 45. Don't give it away. Yeah. You're 45, I'm 46. So, yeah, one year older than you. Yeah. A long time ago in a quasar far away. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, yes. If... And as you say, I think I kind of surprised most of my friends on Facebook with the launch of this comic book. Mm. Uh, because I don't, I don't know. Like one, a downside is I don't really self-publicize too much. Right. So the, the geek comic book side of me was uh, tucked away in a, a few groups on Facebook and stuff, and then suddenly I hit everybody with the Kickstarter on my Facebook page. So. <laughs> That's probably when you first heard about it. Well, yeah, you know what? You have been kind of, how can I say? You've been kind of like a swan, gliding on the surface, but really frantically kicking along. I feel like, a lot of frantically kicking. Yeah. So with regard, like, okay, I, I, like, over the course of time, I've known you to work in the whole fitness sector, and, like, you, like, did that for a bit. Uh, how, like, how did the comic come to play? I don't know. Do you want like a whole rundown? On... <laughs> uh, yeah, no, come on, man. Like, you, you know what? This is your this is your window right now. Okay, yeah. I'm not sure how many people want to listen to this, but right, really, really quick summary on the, on my life, I guess, right? So we met back in the day, and it was at a Quasar Centre. Yes. If anybody's uh, unfamiliar with it, it's a uh, laser shooting space games, paintball with laser guns, basically. Yeah, laser and... quest for anyone outside of the UK or something like that. There you go. So I worked in the first one in the country. <laughs> and, uh, like with, you'll probably get a theme from this during uh, the podcast, but like with anything, I'm a bit all in. So I think then we we had the best team in the country. We, you know, I would <clears throat> arguably shout I was the best player in the country at one point with the highest scores and stuff. So uh, yes. back then. You were for a time. <laughs> <laughs> things change. I know. <laughs> um, and I worked in, I worked in, I worked as a technician in a bowling alley. Mm -hmm. Then I moved from there, worked in retail and stuff. Uh, we moved through to, um, I decided to move into office work and finance, end up in finance. Don't ask me why. Like, don't ask me why uh, maths GCSEs, but I ended up working in finance. <laughs> okay, yeah. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I took a bit of a departure to set up a, um, a gym. Mm. And I would run uh, manager gym uh, and dropped back out of that back into finance about three years ago. But always had sort of, I don't know, you want to call them a side hustle and stuff. So basically had uh, fitness was always something that was part of 
I took I took sports seriously. Yeah. Um, when I was younger, um, competed in sort of everything from football, American football, uh, badminton, kickboxing. Uh, yeah, quite a lot of things. And then uh, I did coaching badges in football, and I tra- I trained people uh, as a sort of personal project. I would help people get their goals, training them, uh, whether it's fat loss, body composition, uh, putting on muscle, um, studied, got some qualifications. Um, yeah, and the whole gym thing was about trying to change people's lives, mm-hmm. which I went through a franchise and I've got my uh, thoughts on franchising. I'm happy to share. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I, never had to, I had to leave that business. Yes. Uh, it wasn't profitable which i mean we can go into that at some point okay um and then we're here now on the side of things i always like to keep busy um and hobbies i prefer hobbies that have potential to maybe turn a little bit of money okay so another few things uh i'm heavily i play fantasy football i've got a twitter account for fantasy football and i make money out of uh fantasy football team uh also play a bit of poker oh and yeah, I'm a profitable poker player, so yeah, there's a lot going on. The comic. Yeah, well, like this is a thing. Yeah, like, <laughs> like I'm. It's like I've been opened up to uh, so many new things. Poker, never knew that. Like, yeah, fantasy football. Well, like this is a thing. Profitable. I never knew you could turn a profit on fantasy football, but yeah, I mean, it, we're not talking huge things, but um, last year's profit about. Twelve hundred pounds in profit for fantasy football. Wow, like... uh, which was nice. This year it's not going so well, but I need to work harder. <laughs> uh, but poker, fantasy football, very similar things. Where if you make the right decisions, yes, you should. You should. Like luck is always key. But mm. if you make the right decisions. A lot of people you're playing against other people. The best kind of gambling is playing against other people, rather than betting shops and uh, the house. Yeah. Because you only have to be better than the other people that you're putting money in against. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll put it this way: just like, just be grateful you're not. How, how can I say? Uh, I'm like Man C at this present time. <laughs> <laughs> just leave it at that. <laughs> oh, it did bring a smile to me and Karen. Oh, they won't get banned. If oh, no, 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 like, like this, no, like this is the thing. Uh, it's going to go to the tribunal, and like they're going to most really. They, like I think they're gonna take a little bit of a shellacking, but I don't think it's gonna be like yeah. If it if they got fully, if they got fully banned, that's it. They're down two leagues. Personally, personally, I think they've been hit with a two year ban, so that when they appeal, they can reduce it to one year, and right. then actually play, players won't make dramatic decisions based on one year being out of football. So well, you know what. Europe. They've got to watch out what the Premiership says because if they're in like breach, of, yeah. if they're found guilty of being breach of fair play, that means points off or getting reduced down to lower leagues. So, yeah, I'm not Premiership or uh, I'm not sure how heavy they're going to go to be honest. And well, you know what? It's going to be very light. Me thinks very light. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's like, oh, you got banned from the Champions League. Uh, don't worry, don't worry, <laughs> don't worry, that TV revenue is going to be there for you, mm, a little bit cynical there, but nevertheless, but tell me this, so, oh. comic, like, yes. okay, like, and, uh, history, yeah? yeah, well, <laughs> a- anthology comic, okay, a comic with one character, that's, that's one thing, but when you're talking yep. about anthology, a group of characters, that's a lot of spinning plates, um, can you tell us how this came into play? Well, the good thing is there's a team, okay? So mm. with something like an anthology and comics in particular, uh, you're as strong as the team, basically. Mm. So the whole thing started <laughs> about three years ago. Um, and we we're not going to talk about the comic. The comic started pretty much its birth was about seven or eight months ago, uh, the idea. Okay. But three years ago, uh, in a fit of nostalgia, as I was flicking through Facebook, Yeah started looking for um, any groups uh, around a comic that I was in love with as a kid. Ah. So that comic book was 2000 AD. Yeah. So it's where Judge Dredd started life. Um, you, most people will probably know the comic from that. Yeah. Uh, he's had a couple of films and such. Now there's uh, Rogue Trooper, right, as well? Yeah, Rogue Trooper. There's characters, Strontium Dog. Uh, yeah, Judge Dredd. 
there's some big so there's some major writers that have uh, cut their teeth in there so you've got uh, somebody like Alan Moore have you ever heard of Alan Moore I, so come on now come on Watchmen Dark exactly. Knight yeah he's, yeah he's done V for Vendetta Watchmen mm. um, he started so he did a, a strip called Halo Jones which was pretty 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 massive for me actually as a kid it was a strong female character mm. uh set in the future really well written fantastically drawn by an artist called ian gibson who just was my favorite artist nice uh to the point that it had such an influence on me that when i had kids my first uh my first born my daughter scarlet her middle name is halo uh -huh. <laughs> not named uh, after the computer game then yeah uh, no, no. <laughs> And then uh, I actually reached out at one point to the artist um, and commissioned him to draw a picture with my daughter, who was then about three in it. So that stands, that sits proudly in my front room. Nice. Uh, so what I'm giving you is 2000 AD was like a really big influence on me. Mm. Uh, another character called Slain, who was a bit of a barbarian type thing. It was all Kel Celtic mythology, um, but it was really good. Like the comic gave me... There were some really good writers and stuff at the time, Pat mm. Mills, um, John Wagner, and they just gave you a lot of information. It was it wasn't a throwaway comic. It wasn't. I'm not massive on superhero comics, and actually, although I collected lots at the time, I've since got rid of pretty much all of them. Mm. But this nostalgia thing threw me back to that time because I don't know, happy times, right? When you're a kid, go to the shop, pick up a comic book. There's your pocket money. Take it home, and that was that was it. Right. Well, well I'll put it this way, Let, let's let's not undersell the power of nostalgia. And uh, yeah. one company which seems to be buying it in droves is Disney. Uh, if you if you if it wasn't for if it's been in the seventies, eighties, or nineties, they pretty much own it. <laughs> if you think about it that way. But yes, um, with this, um, I've, I've looked at a couple of pieces of art with regards to it. Uh, yeah. The tech, like the techno freaks artwork. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very rem reminiscent to Tank Girl in some regards. Okay, it has right. a, Like I have a sort of similar vibe. Um, yeah, yeah. It's interesting what you'll get from it. Yeah. So, um, so what we've got um, coming back to comic is we we ended up. Uh, let me let me just wheel it back a little bit. Yeah, go on. Um, in this fit of nostalgia, I found a group called 1977 to 2000 AD. Mm -hmm. It was uh, run by a guy called, uh, it was created and run by a guy called uh, Ben Cullis. Okay. Um, so I started posting and sharing some of the information on there, um, sharing stories. Um, got interested in buying these, these comics again, the old ones. Yeah. Uh, so I did a bit of collecting of comics and such. Um, and then during the course of this group, we all got friendly. It became, it's, it's quite a tight, nice community. Mm. What you've got in there is uh, you've got, a lot of talented people that are now that grew up with a comic were writers. Um, it's kind of like I don't know, you know, the fouled football player type thing, yeah, <laughs> where maybe they were they had too many injuries or they didn't quite make it. Well, rather than keep going in your mid twenties and stuff trying to get somewhere, these hmm. guys have ended up in other careers or okay. doing side or they're small press, they're publishing their own things. Um, and these all these guys existed in this community. Um, and then Ben, during a conversation that was happening on uh, one one day, probably about seven or eight months ago, uh, Ben, the creator of the group, basically um, got the idea to start a comic. Why don't we do something in the form of maybe not? We're not taking our cues directly from 2000 AD, but the kind of comics that we loved as kids. Mm. Yeah, so um, it's an anthology comic. It's very British. Um, it's got multiple strips, we've got different creators all over the place. Um, and he started, you know, I think my part in it and, uh, another admin called Dave Healy at the time mm -hmm. was just look, you now we'll support you and we'll run, help run this group while you're, uh, while you're trying to put this together and not thinking it was actually going to go particularly far. Uh, suddenly Ben pitched up with this list of names who had agreed to take part. Um, and it's a passion project, you know. There was no, um, there was no false promises of money, etc. Mm -hmm. It was like, let's put this together, let's see if we can get off the ground, um, let's let's make it quality, and then let's see where it can go. Um, when I looked at this list of talent, mm. it was 
yeah, it was pretty incredible. It was people I'd seen their work. I'd seen lots of stuff from them. Uh, there were some really fantastically talented people, artists and writers. Um, and I thought, you know what, this could actually go somewhere. Nice. nice. Um, and then Ben has actually gone part-time in his job to drive this one forward. Uh, there's another bunch of people that were involved in the groups that we had. Mm -hmm. We pulled in in sort of editorial, promotional capacity. So I'm going to list them out here. Uh, so we've got Ben, who is basically editor-in-chief, creator. Uh, myself and Dave, who were part of the original sort of idea. Um, then you've got another guy called uh, Dave Bedford, who's came in to do like lots of social media. And now he's heavily involved in, you know, we kind of chip in across everything. Uh, and then we've got a guy called Morgan Spiceman, um, who, again, gets involved in everything. We've got uh, Joe Healy, who, again, is on social media. So we've got this collective. We've got this group of people. Um, and then we've got all the talent around it. Mm. Here, making the comic happen, publicizing it. You know, it's got onto Kickstarter. Um, and we've got these fantastic stories. We've got all these artists going on it. Um, we've got enough enough talent, enough creations already for issue two, etc. Um, so yeah, it's snowballed. And what's happened is we've got, as we've been going along, it's got some interest from different parties and we've ended up attracting talent from, you know, the golden age of comics and stuff. Some, some people who would be really famous, uh, in the 2000 AD community. Okay. So yeah. And we've, we've got these guys attached to the comics, some of them. So yeah, it's really it's really starting to take off to the point where we've launched Kickstarter now. Right. Uh, we've got just under two weeks left on that. So it ends on the end of March. Uh, sorry, March 1st um, at midnight. And we initially wanted to set our target on Kickstarter uh, to be able to do a, a small run of comics, um, get them out there. Now... So we set our target to cover all publishing costs, all yeah. our overheads. Uh, I think it was three thousand seven hundred and seventy-seven pounds, um, and now we're about two thousand pounds over that already. Nice, very nice. So Congratulations. Means, hey. yeah, thank you very much. But what that means is we're now in opportunity where we can increase our print run. Mm. We can look at what that can do for the second uh, issue, uh, and we can look at how we can reward people um, who have been involved in the project. So. Um, yeah, it's it's been very successful at the moment, and again, we've still got best part of two weeks, and all that money. I think the thing with Kickstarter is when somebody achieves the cost they wanted to back, okay, it off a little bit. But mm. actually, it's really important that we keep pushing this funding because the more funds we can get, the more chance of this thing having a life cycle. Oh, oh yeah, no, like cash flow is king. I have exactly. a book you should read about that. Phil Knight, um, Shoe Dogs, very good book. Cool. I live at me. My nine to five is credit control. Well, yeah, you like. I'm careful, so. Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, if you don't know about like cash flow, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like going, dear God, man, what have you been doing all these years? But yeah, uh, one of the things which I find interesting, uh, you're actually going to do a print run and uh, not just have it in the digital space. Uh, no, do you know? So um, yeah, so something I've just totally forgotten to mention, which probably I should have brought up, is. Yeah. Um, so the comic's called The 77. Yes. Now, that is uh, a particular year for comics. That's the year where Star Wars comic came out. Uh, uh. That's the year where 2000 AD first got printed. <coughs> uh, so it's, it's a significance that we've taken. It's also a year that most of the people in our community, they tend to be uh, <laughs> dinosaurs like me. Uh, <laughs> but they, they were reading their comics in the 70s and 80s. Yes. So we're trying to capture that feeling, okay? So that, that feeling is not necessarily in trying to date uh, the artwork and stuff like that, but it's just, it's the vibe, it's the feeling. Um, I've actually written a strip for it as well, which has been drawn by my cousin, who's a fantastic artist, that again, tried to get into comic book art way back when, when I was about 16, I guess. Mm. Um, and it didn't go the right way, but now yeah, he's exceptional. So he's doing the cover for the first issue. Um, some of the famous people we got involved we've got a guy called uh, Glenn Fabry you might have heard of he's doing the alternate cover you'll know him because of uh, the comic Preacher probably okay yes um, like recent TV series on Amazon right yeah yeah so he did the comic artwork uh, on that 
We've got, again, my favourite artist, Ian Gibson's involved. He's got uh, an unpublished story, which we're publishing a page on our back cover. Okay. Uh, just like a spread on the back cover. So he's in there as well. So there's like there's some real fantastic talent in there. Again, as I say, we're trying to capture the 70s and 80s, that feeling where you got your pocket money, you went to the news agents, and you was really excited about getting your comic. Okay. And there was a bunch of stories in there that exposed you to things that you wouldn't, you know, if there's a... I, I guess back then, I would never have written, uh, read a comic about Celtic mythology. But I would have picked up a comic about a future lawman, mm -hmm. and I would have been exposed to this. Or I would have been exposed to this uh, central female character in Halo Jones. So it's an opportunity to get people immersed into other things, um, and just that vibe. Yeah, no, but that's one of the things I do like sort of about anthology series. It doesn't sort of limit... Like because look, um, for like for example, um, um, is Black Mirror? Like, oh yeah. Okay. Now look, uh, I watched the first season of that. Like basically, I watched the first episode. I went, nope, that is not for me. I'm not watching this. <laughs> Prime Minister, no, 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 no. Then like the later seasons came along, and I watched one of them because it sort of hit a sort of Star Trek theme because. Okay. I'm into the whole sci-fi thing and like I was like I was quite impressed and I, then I watched the season from there and I was pretty much in and the sort of different concepts and the different areas it sort of yeah. bounced around it sort of introduces you or just opens you up to having the possibility of like yeah okay a Celtic warrior as you just mentioned yeah. like uh, a future cop you yeah. things that you just wouldn't yeah it exposes you to things you just wouldn't necessarily watch or pick up to start with so mm really good format yeah and like yeah with that i just think it just gives much more of an opportunity well uh to just have maybe not, i would say maybe a wider audience or just get you that like never know which one out of the anthology might be like a mega hit if you get one yeah yeah uh -huh. absolutely like we'll, we'll have all these stories in there and then uh, what we're looking to do as well is we're looking to do a combination of things so one of the things is breaking Un, unsigned talent as it were mm -hmm. so we, we want these names involved because it's quality we yeah. already know it's quality and actually it'll help sell the publication um then we've got this 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 raw talent that you know they can put it on the page and they're alongside these people in an anthology again people are gonna like oh hang on a minute who wrote that who mm. drew that um so it's an opportunity to actually get people some visibility and improve their careers yeah, no. Um, yeah, it's great. And like you, like you mentioned a number of people in the team you have at this present time. Um, yeah. What, like, how many people are in this? Because right now it sounds like there's quite a healthy collective. Uh, could you tell us more? Yeah, it's uh, it's been a bit organic to be honest. So, um, <clears throat> in terms of collective, we've got a central group of people who are working, as I say, on the comic to uh, to make the comic happen. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a pool of talent outside of that who are your creators, who are uh, writers, letterers, colorists, writer, um, artists, who, you know, they're the secondary pool. Um, so they're the guys we want to put out there. We want them to do well. It's all, uh, it's all creator-owned IP as well, so intellectual pro uh, property, it's, we're not taking anything from anywhere else. We're not copying anything. It's mm. all original stuff. Um, and then the central team, as I say, they're the guys. So most of us have worked together on the sort of fan group that we worked on before. Um, and we've all become a collective because, well, like any team, everybody's got different talent. Mm. Um, we can pull it together. We'll be much more successful if we work, all work together. So um, I think I, I've named them all already. Um, but we get when something's needed, one of us can usually do it. Now, the downside to that is one thing that we haven't talked about is financial, right? Moment is completely a passion project, okay? So, nobody involved, anybody who was involved looking to try and get dollar dollar straight out, it you know, it's not the project for them, and we've lost a few people along the way, mm. and that's absolutely fine because what we've got is we've got people who are all pushing in the right direction. Everybody's rowing, nobody's drilling holes. Um, 
And what we've got now is we've got an opportunity, get this off the ground, and then we work to see how we turn it into a business if it's successful. Yeah. Um, or, you know, maybe it just becomes a self-funding, um, almost like a sort of charitable thing where we just keep rolling it over. It covers its costs. Um, who knows where it's going to go? Right, it's an organic thing. Mm. Yeah, no, I just, like, with, well, with everyone talking the 21st century and anyone's had exposure to Gary Vee or anyone of his ilk, like, it's brand, brand, build your brand, build your brand, day in, day out. But it's one of those things where people who might not get that in the beginning, uh, they're not, they're playing too much of a short game, perhaps, and where they've got to look at kind of like, who knows, five years down the line, maybe longer than that. It doesn't happen overnight, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I think I think generally you've got to go in. It's tough. Sometimes people have to do something. They have to make money straight away. Mm. I get that. It's understandable. Like We've all got bills to pay. We've all got things to do. But you generally have to be passionate about something. And then they, when you say about building your brand and stuff, that's it. You know, it's it's... We've got this thing now, the 77. We don't know where it's going to go. Like, don't be close to avenues and paths, right? Mm -mm. Wherever it goes, it goes. Um, as long as there's passion behind it, it will keep moving. Um, if we can turn it into something that is a business, I'm sure that is something that will happen. Um, it's a tough marketplace, comic books. So that's another thing to um, consider. You know, when you put the numbers down, when I've put the numbers into a spreadsheet on you know, and everything, and putting in creators' wages and everything else, it's really difficult. It's a really difficult business. Mm. But let's get it off the ground as a passion project, and then let's just see. Let's just see. I've been involved in a few things that have started as passion. When we talked about um, personal training and yeah. um, fitness and such, you know, a lot of things I did to start with was just about helping people. That was it. There was no money coming back from it. Mm. Uh, in fact, it was um, when I started making any money from it, it was from necessity. It was when I'd already been helping people for like a decade. Yeah. And I needed money. There was a point I needed money. I was in a tough spot. And it was like, well, how can I make... I looked at secondary jobs. And I'm like, well, actually, this doesn't really work out. What's the point of me getting like £6 an hour? I need to, I need to do better than this. So um, I created some fitness classes. Um, promoted them, put them out there, got paid, you know, and what was coming back was a lot better mm -hmm. than an hour. Um, and then you get the side effects. So the first class I ever put on, I remember, first class I ever put on was uh, in a company I was working at at the time, and I did it as a, it was a Thursday fitness class. Okay. And I had all these people turned up, and I give them a really good class, um, and I'm confident. I know what I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing. And at the end of that class, I had two people come up to me and ask me about personal training. And it's something I wasn't considering before that. Um, but you don't say no to things, right? Well, so, yeah, no, I would say you've got to put yourself out there, make sure, well, to let the sort of opportunities start coming your way. Uh, it seems like, well, sometimes just out of, yeah, you're just doing it, but as like for yourself, uh, out of necessity. And like, yeah. That's great. There's a great phrase that I love, which is uh, put yourself where the luck can find you. Ah, so good. that's that's kind of it, right? So you put yourself there. I put myself there. I open up this thing. It was take, you know, it maybe made me like thirty pound in an hour, mm -hmm. which I needed that at the time. Uh, two people come up to me, asked about personal training. I trained both of them for about two years for three days a week, following that class, mm. um, and I gave them amazing, amazing training. They stuck to their goals. They hit everything. You know, these these guys got complimented by every everywhere they went for the changes they made in their lives. That's satisfying. Mm. And I made a little bit of money out of it as well. Yeah. That doesn't hurt. No, no, it doesn't hurt. But it must have, like, kicked off a spark in yourself where you looked at secondary jobs, which were paying, like, six-something pounds an hour. And then, like, all of a sudden, you, like, you, did, you grafted, did a bit of work on it, set up the program, and now you're making 30 pounds for an hour's work like you know what i mean it might be a class but in comparison to time to money reward that's much better yeah exactly exactly it's there it's uh sometimes you know 
it's hard to have the confidence the first time you step into something, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember that first class. I like, and do you know what? Everywhere in business, anything I've ever done is that first step. You feel like a fraud, right? <laughs> you step out. You know, even my nine to five. I remember stepping in the first. I moved jobs and I stepped into an office full of CEOs and uh, sorry, a meeting room full of CEOs and FDs, and I'm like, I don't belong here. And then you've got to show a little bit of confidence. Once you start talking, and then suddenly I had, I knew what I was talking about, and mm. people around me were like, "Yeah, we do have to do that." And I'm like, "These these people are like really important people. You build them up, right? And these people are really important people. And then you start to get confidence that actually, you do know what you're talking about. These people should listen to you. Kind of goes from there, doesn't it? Well, it goes from there, and like this is the thing um, with doing the training uh, like basically at your first workplace um, it kind of where did it kind of lead from there would you be able to tell us about that yeah, yeah. Um, so that class uh, went on it led to first personal training then two people mm -hmm. um, and then I had too many clients personal training so what <laughs> I mean is I was <laughs> working, it was all right, <laughs> there was no um, I didn't publicize this anything what it was was i had the class mm. i had people that asked personal training through there and then word of mouth yeah so what what i end up in a situation which actually was it sounds like it, it's a rubbish problem right um, yeah. like it's your first world problem my friend <laughs> one class a week <laughs> and then i was training so i was doing my nine till five thirty yeah then I would start training people in parks, in meeting rooms, um, in their house, in their garden, um, from six o'clock till about ten o'clock at night. Yeah. So Monday to Thursday, I'd be doing that. Um, so Thursday at the class, but I'd be training people hour um, hour long sessions back to back. Um, I'd be up Regent's Parkway, outdoor, uh, Primrose Hill outdoor gym, um, Primrose, uh, Regent's Park yeah. running track. Uh, I'd be uh, in parks at the back of Holborn. I'd be in meet rooms in people's uh, companies. Uh, and that probably was going for about two to three years. Thanks. And still, uh, one of the guys I trained, yeah. who was uh, an IT director, approached me, I was, so I'd already moved roles um, for my nine to five to a company and actually the role I was in mm. was to move a finance department to India yeah. um, and that had a lifespan. So basically it was about a year and a half, that role. Yeah. And about six months from the end of it where I'm considering what I'm gonna do next, I was approached by one of the guys I trained who got really good results and was looking to, um, Sold some property with uh, him and some family, and we're looking to invest in um, a franchise or originally, I think, a restaurant business. But then he approached me to ask about whether I was interested in joining them in uh, a gym franchise proposition. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's have a look at this. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you want me to go from there? Right. So, what we did next? So, we started to investigate the franchise opportunities in gyms in the country. Mm. Um, and got it down to two, which are, you might be familiar with Anytime Fitness. Yes. Uh, and the other one was a company called Energy Fitness who did uh, some gyms called Fit for Less um, and some energy um, uh, gyms. So. Yeah, no, I'm aware of both, like, both, like companies. Yeah. Cool. I, haven't, I haven't used either of those, but yeah. Okay. So they're both, uh, well, the uh, energy was down on the, uh, the budget their proposition was a budget gym, mm. around about the twenty pound a month membership mark. Um, Fit for Less was, uh, I think they were looking at closer to like forty pounds. And there's a different, totally different propositions. Uh, but we selected uh, Energy Fitness, and we went through the process of signing up with them guys, looking for property, um, and that's what happened. So we started. So I started the hunt for property. Um, I left my other role. Uh, I'd already found property by the time I left my other role. So there was a point where, um, <laughs> you want to talk castles, there was a point where I was doing my, so at this point I have, I have a family as well. I have two, two kids. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, no. Like, what we'd do is we'd get up, 
we get kids ready for school, kids go to school. I go into London, uh, I'm living in Hertfordshire at the moment, I do my 9 to 5 30, then I'll do my three hours of personal training on my classes, whatever it was in the evening, head back probably from London about 10 o'clock at night, have some dinner, get the laptop on, start looking for property and do gym franchise stuff till probably about sort of one o'clock in the morning and then repeat. Um, and that. Yeah, let me interject. Okay. Like, okay. You, you're telling me this schedule, this schedule, like how <laughs> there is, how on earth could you fit all of this into one day? That is, it sounds mental. I don't, I don't know, to be honest. And, um, <laughs> okay. I did it. Look, I mean, I'm laughing now, right? But mm. it does have an effect. It has an effect on your mental health. It has an effect on your family life. Um, you can't do it. You can't just continue to do that. Um, there was a point where, you know, then I had to I had to go, well, hang on a minute. This is this is affecting. So I need to... So the first thing I did, I was to go out on Wednesday. Wednesday became a day off in the evening. Yeah. So that was the first thing there. Then, you know, you can have some family time and um, then I just pour your energy in the rest of the time. Um, I was also, you know, the weekend, so Saturday, Wednesday night and Saturday would generally be, I wouldn't book anything in there. I'd still train some people on a Sunday morning or... Steve, just move your knee slightly out of your face. Yeah, sorry. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, tell you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was training some people Sunday mornings as well, like locally. Yeah. Uh, but then the rest of the Sunday would pretty much be free. Uh, but yeah, so that that cycle of that amount of work probably lasted about six months, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and then found property, found mm. it in an area which I chose. I'd selected a bunch of different areas where I wanted to open the gym, and uh, because I thought they'd be profitable. Yeah. Uh, um, the franchise tries to steer you in directions which probably you don't want to go. I've got, as I say, I've got my views on franchising, but. My views on franchising, in short, is you're not working for yourself. You're working for somebody else. Um, you're not getting a good deal most of the time. Uh, right. You might need them to set something up because you don't know how to do it to start with, but then they're going to feed off you for the rest of your time. So uh, it, it's, uh, how can I say, is it kind of like a, a gilded cage in some regards? They give you all these promises, but then at the end of the day, you're trapped. Yeah, I, that's not a bad way of describing it. Uh, if it's not going the way it should go, mm. uh, maybe there's good franchises out there that will help you because um, that's how they sell it. Mm. But there's also franchises that will let you uh, take all of the problems um, and not actually give you what you need. Mm. Now, what, how that affected me is I got a gym in an area called uh, Hatfield which for me was one that I isolated. I isolated, obviously, a bunch of places in London because there's such a big demographic. Mm. Uh, I isolated an area that I knew well called Edmonton, which you all know, uh, <laughs> because there really wasn't budget gyms in that area and there was a lot of people and it was a perfect proposition. I tried to get an old Tesco unit, uh, but unfortunately, I didn't carry the clout to get that. And weirdly, I think they turned that into a gym afterwards for one of the big groups. <laughs> I end up uh, outside of London. One of the few places that I went for was uh, Hatfield. Mm. Now, one of the reasons there is, although they only have about a 35,000 population, um, the demographic was boosted by the University of Hertfordshire. Ah. So they have their own gym, but there was no budget gym in the area. And students, why wouldn't they like a budget gym, right? Well, yes. It's only the first year they're on campus usually, right? So that's where they're tied into the uh, on-campus gym. Once they're out in the community, they're going to be closer to my gym than they are to the university gym. Bang. What could go wrong, huh? Well, well, what could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? So, uh, there's a huge, huge student population. They're all in the cat. The, the age group is the perfect catchment for my gym. Mm. Uh, I need approximately, to make it really, really successful gym, I need about 2,000 members. Okay. So um, we built the gym. So we have builders. I found an old nightclub uh, that we could get. We negotiated rent on the nightclub. I uh, went to work stripping full refit. So I stripped out the nightclub, mm. refit. Um, I basically designed the whole setup, uh, chose all the equipment, 
um, and the setup. It was built. It was built for people joining the gym to get a journey, um, and really built for women to progress towards weight training. Okay. Which, ah. in my opinion, is the best thing that they could be doing for themselves. Forget running on a treadmill. So I had some treadmills, I had some bikes, blah, blah, blah. But in my gym where you sit on any of these equipment or run on any of these equipment, you'll have a look around and you'll be very close to a bit of weight training equipment that you should be doing. And then my team was set up. The USP was, you know, we talked to everybody. Everybody knew us. We knew them. We knew what their goals were. We would, um, we would introduce them to bits of equipment we thought they should be using until they felt comfortable with it because it's not easy for certain people. The average person joins the gym, walks in, panics because they see all this iron stuff everywhere and jumps on a treadmill you can't that doesn't get you anywhere that's that's six weeks and then you stop coming to the gym so built this gym from scratch um went into pre-sale sold about 700 memberships before it was even a gym uh nice. which <laughs> is its own challenges that's on the street talking to people going to fairs fates whatever it is mm. by asda wherever it is um, getting people to sign up and then just before about six weeks before we we're going to open uh, I would regularly check the internet just to see what gyms in the local area were doing and bang this other gym pops up on the radar that's mm. about to go into pre-sale oh, no. probably about a 10 minute walk less than 10 minute walk from my gym and their proposition is different in as much as they're a 24 hour gym it's bigger, it's got more equipment, mm. it's cheaper. Now, money talks, so they're cheaper. I know that's going to happen, then starts the struggle. So what I do is I've got to make sure I stick to our opening time. We promise people I open on that date. We're open on the date. Mm. Uh, I build a membership up to about between thirteen and 1,400 people. Okay. The other gym opens, uh, and then I spend a long time competing with this gym that is bigger, cheaper, and has more stuff than us. And it's 24 hours. Like, this sounds like a familiar chain. Uh, like, uh, well, yeah. actually, it's not the one you're thinking of. Not uh, pure? No? <laughs> it's, but it's a very similar concept. Okay. Um, and so what I found is, uh, so the franchise, for instance, their first answer to a competition like that is to reduce your price. Now, I don't, <laughs> I don't have a good answer. Um, I'm familiar with gyms. I've been around gyms for a long time. Yeah. So my theory is that actually there's not too big a difference between the cost of a gym. You don't walk or drive further than you have to. So mm. I'm still, I was well positioned in the town from where this other gym was. So I put my prices up. <laughs> now the idea was no, yeah. our service was second to none. Okay. Well, we the members and we took them on a journey and we really did help people out. Also, you'd have to go past a lot of the population that would be gym going population would have to pass my gym to get to the other gym. Now, I just don't think a lot of people are willing to do that. And I think they'll pay an extra five or a month or whatever it is. So I, I think generally my gym membership was about £7.50 a month more than theirs. Okay. Uh, but in the two years that I operated the gym, my yield went up every single month, um, so business-wise, it was good. I didn't. What didn't increase was our membership. Right. It pretty much sat around about the thirteen hundred mark. Okay. Now, when I'm saying I needed about two thousand to make it really profitable. Yeah. Now thirteen hundred was just about wiping its face. So, Ooh. and it's a business that is, when you own a manager. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If there's a yeah. problem, I don't know. If there's a problem, if say uh, you get a massive leak in your in the water system in changing rooms, and you get a call at six o'clock in the morning, you're out of bed and you're down there and you're down. It's above Iceland and you're in Iceland and you're clearing up the mess in Iceland and making a manager not sue you. <laughs> that kind of this. You've got people, staff members who decide to walk out on shift halfway through a shift. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's it's yeah, and it takes it's a heavy toll. Mm. It can, yeah, it can really get to you. Um, so there was a point where we had to leave that business behind. Okay, 
Like, um, is the gym still there or is it? Like... It's still there. It's renamed. It's still uh, technically owned by the. Uh, I think it's part owned by the franchise now. Mm. Uh, got another part owner. I guarantee they're not doing very well. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's not something I want to go back to. Part owned by the franchise now. That kind of sounds a little bit shady. Like it's a case of they made you take on all the setup costs. They like made you do all of the work at the beginning, just to like watch carefully from the sidelines. Like soon as it was a case of oh you guys are not doing that well, hey hey we got some paperwork here. We'll just come in as half your partner, and then yeah. I'll tell you the story, meanwhile, but I have to do it off air because, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I won't. I won't say anything else. I'll leave I'm it. Very at that. cautious on my opinions that I'm passing on here because, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a tricky, tricky environment. Uh, no problem. Uh, let's move on swiftly. But with regards to like, with regards to the sort of realm of fitness now, if you were yeah. to do this again yourself. Would be a case of you would do something a little bit more. Would you have a place, or would you do something a little bit more boutique, or like how would like would you? What, <laughs> what type of different strategy would you take? Well, I already have uh, my plan for a new business in fitness. Right. Um, I'm probably gonna have to keep some of that under wraps, but we'll do another one when it gets going. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. You see. But yeah, one see? of one of the killers. One of the killers is. Uh, you're, you're your USP, so you got to mm. be cautious who um, you employ. Uh, also, overheads will kill you. So a gym, for instance, if you're charging £20 a month for a membership, mm. your electricity bill, your gas bill, your rates, your rent, your, there's a lot of things, your franchise fee, whatever it is, yeah, there's a lot of things coming out of that before you make any money. Yeah, because when you say 2,000 people, like you think about 2,000 people, that's not a lot of people, but it's still not an easy number to obtain if you get what I mean. No, exactly. And then it's maintaining it, you know, you're it's a constant cycle. So, what you're mm. doing is setting up um, at the start of every month, you've got a board in your office, you're getting all the team around, mm. um, and what you're doing is you're setting your sales targets for the, for the month, you know, how many people you're going to be losing that month. Um, so you're just cycling, you're trying to put on, you know, a net gain of like one, two, three, however many people it is. Mm. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's a grind. Um, one of the things I do at the moment is I do, uh, again, I do a couple of, um, fitness classes for companies. Okay. Um, and I run for fun. I run a boot camp locally. Uh, that's Sunday morning boot camp, which I know you've seen the photos. You liked one today. What do you mean? Seen the photos? I've actually done. Have you been there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, 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 evil, you, you evil bastard! Come on now. <laughs> like, yes, come on. How did you do it? Oh, well, yeah. Oh, that was all good fun. Thank you. Like, you know what? That's how much of a sadist you are, my friend. That's how much of a sadist. <laughs> we're not. We're not people to you. We're just like, yeah, next yeah. victims. That's all. Yeah. Look, I did your right. class. I love everybody. Yes, you love to torture everybody. Well, you should have done a big run before you came to my boot camp. Look, 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 I got there. I was early. I <laughs> thought, you know what I mean, get a quick five miles in, which I did. But yeah, well it still doesn't take away from you're a sadist and you don't remember I did your class. It's like I was one of the many victims. Well played, well played. <laughs> now that thing, that started organically as well. I, I got yeah. a request from... Um, so... When you have kids, there's always a bunch of uh, so a bunch of parents that you get friendly with, etc. So we so I play football with uh, a bunch of guys who are like fathers from school on a Sunday night. Yeah. Um, and then you get to meet people. One of their wives contacted me and said, "Look, we're part of a netball team. We need to get fitter. Will you come help us out?" I'm like, "Yeah, come on in. We'll do it. We'll do a little boot camp." And it kind of bloomed from there. So what we did is we got we got these girls, these netball girls, like super fit. Mm. Uh, to the point where they absolutely smashed their league, won the title. Um, <laughs> they were telling stories every week when they come by. They were like, oh, my God, Katie threw the ball from one end to the other. Everybody was like, oh, my God, that's boot camp. Yeah, so it was like, you know, we're addressing the weaknesses. Um, I've done sports coaching and stuff. It was it was an interesting thing to do. I've never played netball. So for mm. me, that was interesting and intriguing. And then from there, what we did is we started to 
collect mainly parents from school um, and then word of mouth. And now we get, again, I don't publicize it. We get about somewhere, well, generally somewhere between sort of eight and 16 people a week. Yeah, um, no, they're um, a good, fun little group, I've got to say. When the weather's like today, <laughs> we've got hurricane, what's the, what's the, what's the uh, thing called, a storm? I, 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 look, you know what? I don't know where it's called. All I know, I was soaked to the bone when I did my hill runs today. Right. Absolutely drenched. Well, I got, five, what... I got five people to boot camp this morning, which uh, yeah. I think I'll call that a win. <laughs> but we get a session and we'll go for a coffee after. It's like, it's good vibes. That's it. Yeah. It's when you do things that you enjoy, it's good. When you see people making progress, that's all good as well. And, you know, it really doesn't have much of a financial impact on anything. Yeah. But, it's almost a hobby, so. <laughs> nah, I like it. I like it. Like, this is the thing. You know, I've got to say, yeah, when I did do your boot camp, um, like, seeing as I come from the realm of when I'm in the gym, it's mostly sort of heavy weights. And, yeah. like, yeah, my sort of body weight stuff is more minimal, not sort of, like, full on, which you kind of do with that. And I've got to say, yeah, I did feel it. There was a couple, like, there was a couple of things, like the bear crawls. Oh, God, I hate them. <laughs> which, <laughs> which I'm, all I've got to simply say is, yeah, uh, when was the last time I did a bear crawl? When I was at your bear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great but, exercise, me. It's a great exercise. Well, yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Like, yeah, I don't like to see my heart sort of like trying to get escape, go, you know what? I'm out. <laughs> You're lucky, I used to I used to get people bear crawling up Primrose Hill. Oh, well, like, hey. Hey, look, put it this way. Like, living in Crouch End, I've got enough hills oh, yeah, in my you, life. Yeah, you have. You have. <laughs> yeah, look. look yeah, put this way. To escape Crouch End, I've got to... I, I, there is no way I can't go uphill. I have to go uphill somewhere along the way. So, yeah, that's all good fun. But, yes. Um, with, like, with all of this sort of experience you build and stuff like this, and, like, you know what I mean? Like, you've got other side projects in the boil, which we'll discuss on a later date. Now, um, how do you think, you, like, how do you reckon you're going to apply it with uh, coming back to the 77? Uh, how do you think that's going to all sort of tie in on your part? Well, I think with the 77, what the good thing is, is that it was never my baby. It was never my idea. Mm. Um, it was never the project that I have to, you know, power through. You know, that. Yeah. That's Ben, this guy, Ben Cullis. So okay. he's the driving force on it. Mm. Um, and he's incredible at just getting, like, 100 miles an hour getting stuff done. Now, where I consider my part in it, I don't, I don't know. I'd guess, uh, uh, I don't know. If he's uh, if he's just powering the ship, I'm there somewhere. I'm, I'm in a lookout. I'm up there. I'm just making sure <laughs> we're steering away from trouble. Yeah. Uh, in my capacity, just I'm just trying to use experience and um knowledge that i have to try and point us in the right direction a little bit if we're moving away from that direction just trying to make us as efficient and as yeah just just successful as i think we can be okay. um from my point in the opportunity i had uh as well to do so this is an opportunity for me to tick a bucket list um which was i can't draw <laughs> okay but I figure I can write a story. So I write a story in the vein of the stories that I would have read or enjoyed when I was a, a child. Mm. Um, it's just a five-page story. Um, it could lead to something. If it's, if it's uh, popular, it could lead to... I could extend it out a little bit. Okay. Um, the other thing that ticked the bucket list is my cousin who I discovered uh, discussed, who was a really good artist. Is that your uh, cousin from Wales? That's right, yeah, yeah. Aid Hughes, his name is. Yeah. Um, I remember he's a fantastic show. artist. Yeah. Um, and he's going to draw my strip. So he's drawing a strip. He's done the cover for the magazine, which is uh, is my character, one of my characters, which is, you know, it's huge. It's fantastic. It's like the little kid in me is just like going nuts right now. Mm. And that tick on that bucket list. Um, I've tried also through connections that I've made. What I haven't mentioned is during this. Um, this group that we had beforehand mm. is we got involved in talking to some of the um, original creators of our comics that we l loved as kids uh, to the point where 
actually I got the opportunity to join interview a lot of these people. Um, and that ended up in a little comic zine that got sold online. Uh, so that's another thing that sort of happened as a, <laughs> a side part of this. Um, but ticking that box, getting a strip out there, getting my cousin to draw it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. If, if nothing else that is done, that's a bucket list. If the comic's successful as well, I've had a part in it. Um, it can sit in the rest of the things I do. It probably takes too much of my time, social media wise, um, because it feels like a hobby. But <laughs> quite often, get you get off your phone, get off your phone. <laughs> I got to be careful. I got, I got. She, she's right. So, <laughs> she's always right. What you do? Um, so yeah, you have to taper it back, and I have to just yeah, I have to be like a just just a cog in that wheel. Um, to help it go in the right direction, I think. So, you know, they could do it without me. Um, I like to think they'll do it better with me. So that that's that's where we are. No, no, it's good. It's good. Like, so, like, a couple of the bucket list, like, yeah. yeah. So what would be something else on the bucket list you'd be looking to do? On the bucket list? Well, that would be the business, the fitness business that um, I will look. I've, I've, to be honest, I'm... I'm a bit of a procrastinator, so I'm all in. When I do something, I just, I've got to do it, and it's got to be done right. Yeah. Uh, but I might take a while getting to doing it, so, and I'll probably <laughs> make excuses along the way about why it's taking so long, because well. uh, I tend to overanalyze everything. Yeah. So what's happened is I should be doing that business right now, but the comic book has probably taken a bit more time than uh, it should have, and I can't, I can't do everything. So I think once we get one off the ground, I'll start to look at, uh, once we get to the end of this Kickstarter, I'll start to look at seriously launching that fitness business. Um, and uh, yeah, you've got to do your uh, your level two and your level three, mate. Yes, I do. I, I do. Might have, I might have need for you. <laughs> I, like when I like when I get my level two, my level three, uh, yeah, so I will be definitely out there looking to push things forward on a career on that path. It's just go. one of those things. <laughs> It like because of the old dyslexia, things go a little bit slower and it is a type bit frustrating at times, but we persevere and we keep pushing forward. So, okay, yeah. I, honestly, everybody has something they got they got to deal with, right? I, mm. I am not good at certain things, and you know, it's it's what it is, right? However long it takes you, is how long it should take you, so just mm. keep pushing, don't it? absolutely. But yeah, I, I'm still doing stuff to help. Uh, push myself and grow, hence why you've got me here doing this right now. So, you know, I mean? so yeah, I'm not trying to rest on my laurels. I'm like definitely trying to push forward as much as I can. Uh, but yeah, uh, with regards to like, I think with the people, you, some of the people you've interviewed, or some of the connections you've like definitely sprouted, and uh, maybe the 77 could have a podcast as well. Uh, with one at S Ball, uh, like hosting it. Who knows? Who knows? But yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's time in the day, isn't it? There's there's not enough hours. <laughs> well, like, look, put it this way: like, um, if anyone can find time in the day to do it, <laughs> it's definitely yourself. Because hey, I wonder how you do. It. I'm like, I'm interested. What time do you go to bed, man? Because I I you're up at like stupid o'clock. Like I get to bed at I get to bed at a perfectly reasonable time. I'm like it's either yeah, around about eight thirty nine, so yeah. So oh, yeah. Well played. And I think of being you, I can never do that. I I literally I never go to bed before midnight. Well, yeah, but it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, but then like I'm up and about uh at the time I need to be to either get to the gym, uh, go to work, or basically if I can get like if my ideal morning is if I can get to the gym and get a run in, that's perfect. So yeah. But, and do you feel like do you feel you're most productive in the morning, or how uh, do you feel? Now basically, when it comes to sort of working out, yeah, um, mornings are more suited for me. Like what I tend to find is, soon if you leave that to the evening, there's always something which will come up. It's yeah. just like you just like oh, you don't intend it to come up. But there's always something will come up which will either distract you or just be like this excuse not to go. So when you when I do sh like when I do my stuff in the morning, it's just like it's out of the way. 
So if something yeah. does come up in the evening, it's like, great. Uh, yeah. So for me, yeah, uh, I do focus like exercising morning. Yeah. I'm lucky enough. Uh, in fact, the only time I, I discovered a long time ago, the only time I had to exercise was lunch times. <laughs> so back then in the business I do nine to five, everybody goes to the pub. Or everybody uh, goes to or sits at their desk, and I'm like, well, you know what? This is good for my mind as well. Mm. So it's my meditation is is weight training. So I'll be there at lunch times three times a week. So that's how I fit in. It's in the morning, too much time getting kids ready for school, right? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Well, get up a little bit earlier. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, just saying. It's all yeah. about logistics, though, right? So in terms of a gym. Yeah, I'd have to go. I'd have to go out, travel to a gym, and then come back after in the morning. Where actually at lunchtime, it kind of fits in my routine. I'm all about laziness and efficiency. <laughs> Which gym do you go to at this present time? Uh, it's a gym group now. It used to be Easy Gym on Oxford Street. Uh, oh wait, I think the big one just uh, oh, what's it yeah. over the uh, shopping uh, centre? Plaza. 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 Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, many a moon ago. Um, a company called Cento used to be next door to them. But okay. yeah, I'm, yeah. Like from what I've seen of images of that, it's not a bad gym. It's, oh, it's bad well equipped. And it's like £25, £26 a month. So it's four, four minute walk from my office. Okay. So I can get there, I can get a good 40, 50 minute workout in. I can get back. Um, luckily, uh, it's weight training. I shower in the morning. I shower in the evening. <laughs> I can go without smelling during the day. Just like, just like hey, Steve. Uh, we just gathered around. We need to talk. <laughs> Steve, work out. Steve, strong. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, Steve stinks. No, but nah, that's good. Um, so training, conditioning. I'm liking it. I'm liking it. Now, <laughs> we've been going for oh yeah, good hour. Yeah, wow. Yeah, got to ask you. Like February the fourteenth, two thousand. I. I know why I'm going to remember this date. Do you know why you're going to remember this date? February the 14th, 2000. 2020, sorry. Oh, <laughs> uh, why am I going to remember that date? Now, come on uh, now. Where were you when you heard the news about Man City? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That was WhatsApp. WhatsApp was going off. <laughs> Yeah, no, we we had a slight discussion about this earlier, but um, just to hear where they just came out, like it was like, what? Man City banned for two seasons of Champions League football. I was like, what? <laughs> it's like, I, um, I don't know. Like me, I was like, I was quite bemused by it. I don't think the ban's going to happen, but yeah. like. <laughs> You know I'm I mean? going to be honest with you. I'm like a mad, you know, like Arsenal. I'm an Arsenal fan. Arsenal season ticket holder. Yeah. It's not a good time for Arsenal at the moment. When I talk football at the moment, day to day, I generally talk about fantasy football because it's going to be <laughs> Man City at the moment and Liverpool is like things I can't talk about because uh, I'm too far away from it. I don't oh. know if you looked at the league recently, but I can't see us in the top half, so. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay, let me have a quick sneak peek. Okay, BBC. The struggle is real. You, you, you're eleventh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah. I'll, the only the only thing that I hold um, as some sort of well, I'm I'm just touching with is when uh, Arsene Wenger took over. We were mid table that season. Yeah, but. And like, yeah, so let's see what uh, let's see what happens next. <laughs> oh yeah, but put it this way, Arteta. Uh, I think Arteta is going to help you quite considerably. I think I like him. I like yeah. you can see Nari's Nari's uh got amongst the team. You can see in the matches what there's flashes of what he's doing on the training ground, mm. which I just couldn't see with Emery before. So I'm very hopeful that we just start to put it together, and once he gets his team in place. So you'll need next one or two transfer windows, I think. Yeah. Uh, but you know, let's let's see. We're going to find out a lot. Yeah, I do think our test, like we're hearing the news about the whole band coming in, it, like, and when Arteta was like, "I'm going to Arsenal," it kind of now it, it feels like he knew what was coming, and it was, <laughs> like, <laughs> it was like, it was like, "Hey, this is what's coming down the pipeline. Uh, do you want to stick yeah. around?" He went, "Nope." <laughs> <laughs> 
Bye bye. Do you, know what, do you know what's wrong with that statement? Is he's got he's got right? Oh yeah, I can't stay at a team without European football. <laughs> well, wow. hang on. Yeah, move along, Premier League. Oh, uh, no, no, hey man, I'm just trying to I've make you feel better. I've podcast before Liverpool actually win the league as well, so. Hey, look, no, put it this way, man. I am not saying anything until it's mathematically impossible. Like, no, yeah. math, yeah. no, look. I think uh-uh. Liverpool fans know more than anybody else not to do that. So <laughs> I still remember watching the game at Anfield where we had to win by two clear goals back in '89. Yeah, we did it. That was uh yeah, that was a that was a moment as an Arsenal fan, maybe not as a Liverpool fan. Yeah, yeah, you, you get what I mean. Look, so, so, <laughs> uh, we could be a thousand points ahead. There's a ah uh, yeah, there's a just like mm nope, not gonna say anything until it's <laughs> all done, dusted. Plain and simple. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got to say, a character like Dick Turpin, a character which is interesting on the comic book as well. Oh, uh, Dick Turpin's, no, that's a separate book, that one. Oh. That is, we're just uh, doing a little bit of advertising for um, a guy who's very good in independent comics. He's putting one out at the moment, so that's the one you'd have probably just seen that image. Yeah. Social media. Because one of the things that, so this group that we originally created or join, I joined about comic books, why it was different to other groups is the vibe. What we want to do is just make it as friendly a place to just share. We wanted people that are, the comic book community is just like any other community, full of a lot of different voices. Mm. Generally in the community, the loudest voices tend to run things. We wanted an opportunity for those who didn't necessarily speak too much to be able to share what their views were and such so what we did is is it's a place where loud people obnoxious people um dickheads <laughs> tend to not last yeah uh, and we we indulge in friendly uplifting positive it's a lot of positivity there right so it means that although we've got a project now going in uh kickstarter there's plenty of other creators that've got projects going, and we're happy to publicise them guys as well. Mm. Um, it's just look, spread that shit. It's nice, right? Yeah. Be, nice, be positive. Um, everybody can survive. Everybody can. Everybody's gonna make it, man. <laughs> With a bit of hard work, dedication, I don't see why not. I don't see yeah, why not. Indeed. Hard work is the thing, right? <laughs> no, put it this way. Look, um, put it this way from. From what you're showing, the way you're, like, basically, the way you've gone about things, like, yeah, stealthy, to say the least, but I've got to say, that uh, good hard work, good commitment, um, and, like, who knows where this will lead, possibly, hopefully, into some sort of great success uh, for yeah. the 77, and, like, yeah, for yourself down the line. Uh, all I've got to say is, yeah, awesome, keep it up, keep it up, yeah. keep pushing forward. Hey, man, hey, what can I say? Uh, yeah, uh, with regards to how people can find uh, the seventy seven, uh, like it's not published yet, is it, or am I wrong about it? So um, you can go to Kickstarter and you can search for the seventy seven. It's mm-hmm. uh, a popular comic books on there at the moment. You can go to Facebook and you can find uh, what we are at the seventy seven. Uh, we're on Instagram. 77 comic or the 77 should find us on most social media platforms mm-hmm. um if you're on facebook you want to drop in on 1977 to 2000 ad that's where we all live day to day anyway um what else is there i don't know i um so you drop some links in i'll i'll put some things in uh if you want to got some fantasy football tips come <laughs> for F- fpl underscore underscore bully on twitter and you'll get some info there. Uh, there's a big community on fantasy football there. Uh, you want to improve your rank? You want to win your mini leagues? You want to win some cash? Okay. Uh, now, with like, if there was one or two things you could either change in the fitness area of the business or the comics area, what would be those one or two things? What in general? In general, like, what comes to mind? Fitness, 
it's an education thing. I could look. We can go deep into this, right? Mm. It, it's people think fat loss is going for a run, like run, 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 run. It's not mm. right. It's there's your body composition there. There's how you improve your life through weight training. Mm-hmm. Get, getting people to understand how to do it. The thing that's difficult is it's a difficult thing to get to do to start with and to do properly. And people need normally need personal training to begin with. Uh, and that's not me trying to promote personal training so I make some more money out of it. <laughs> it's just that it's, it's a really simple thing. So let's throw this one at you anyway, right? It's really, really simple. So your metabolism is the speed that you will consume, uh, your body will consume calories, yeah? Mm. So that's down to um, muscle mass, generally, yeah? Um, if you're going for a run and you're running to lose body fat, what you're doing is you're generally not going to take enough calories in um, or the right macronutrients. This is another story. Mm. What you're going to do is you're going to catabolize. You're going to end up eating your own muscle and that's going to slow down your metabolism. Yes, you'll lose some body weight. You won't necessarily lose percentage of fat that you want to lose. Mm. You stop running and you eat the same calories you ate before, you will get fatter because you have less, <laughs> less muscle mass. Uh, there's some really simple things. We, sh- we could do a whole topic about uh, body composition, fat loss. I've got a lot of things we could talk about. We'll do that another time. Oh, yeah. No. yeah so, so to change people's attitudes, to educate them better, mm. um, and so they know what they're doing. The whole Weight Watchers thing as well, ridiculous. Reducing calories just as a calorie. You can't look at ca- calories. No. Yeah. If you reduce your calorie uh, intake per day, your maintenance level, if you go below your maintenance level, you will lose weight. But it's not necessarily body fat. You will catabolize muscle so that when you go back, so weight, weight, what's probably, oh, maybe I shouldn't even mention that name. No. But it's best best business model in the world. You come <laughs> here, there's weight on the scales. You then stop coming at some point and then you eat normally how you did before and you put more weight on. Yeah. And then you go, hang on a minute. I'm putting more weight on. I've got to go back to Weight Watchers. Mm. No, like um, the biggest loser uh, is back on American TV. Yeah. And like basically, uh, when I first watched The Biggest Loser, I was like, you know, when you kind of get caught up and mesmerized and just like, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, this is a good show. And just like, like and then you, when you actually think about it and you go, this show is all kinds of fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, going, that's back on. So, yeah love to talk to you about that <laughs> like yeah. at some point yeah in the future definitely but oh yeah. my lord but yeah no you raised some good points there um with regards to comics would there be anything or yeah Do you know what comics so the weird thing is that all the people involved in this comic book mm. have had aspirations of a career in comic books i think generally yeah now, I've never had that. That hasn't really been a dream. This is just something that's been a nice little byproduct of uh, hobbyism. Mm. Um, so I generally stopped reading comics for quite a long period of time, probably about 25 years. Okay. Uh, I've picked up a few recently. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, but the industry is difficult because, you know, children have different things now. Mm. Wow. Um, <laughs> you get whatever it is. The industry in terms of comic books for kids is a different proposition now. It's a load of cheap plastic on the front of a comic that has a few articles in it. It's rubbish. Um, it'd be great if people could go back to reading traditional comic books, but that's probably an old person talking. <laughs> Easy, Boomer. Easy. <laughs> <laughs> nah. No. Um, yeah. Like, what were the two last comics you read? You said you read a couple. Uh, oh, I would just say, I'm pretty much picking up um, stuff from 2008. Okay. Uh, so, during what I've done in the last few years is I've accumulated quite a stash of comics to a point where, so, as I say, when I'm all in on something, me, well, so, <laughs> <laughs> these comic books, I had a few hundred comic books from when I was a kid of 2008. Yeah. What I didn't have is the early runs. Um, so, I got it in my head that I wanted to collect all of the comics. Now, there's a lot of comic books. So what I did is, over the course of um, a lot of eBay um, bargain hunting, yeah, um, I collected from number one up to 1,800. What? And then, 
<laughs> okay. And then realised, then realised that actually uh, that's quite a lot of space in my house. Uh, that might have been pointed out by my wife. <laughs> so, so then, what I consider the golden age is from number one to about five hundred and twenty, which is where it was all printed on rubbish old paper. Yeah. And you got the smell, you got the the, the stories, you everything was magical then for me. So I sold everything else, um, and now I've got them, and I've accumulated doubles and triples of a lot of these as well. So because. There's a little investment going on there as well because I think that those comics could be worth a little bit something in the near future. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> excellent. Just yeah. another thing. So all in. Okay, no problem. Uh, right, I'm gonna like it's an hour and fifteen minutes. It's in. A long time. Yes. Uh, like yeah. What I'd like to say is we'll call it t we're gonna call it quits now because yeah. yes we're def like definitely got more to talk about in the future because yeah I think if we did carry on eventually you'd have to give away more of more of information <laughs> than you want to at present but yeah definitely ah it has been a pleasure uh, speaking to you today Steve like thank you for coming on the podcast look that uh, for anyone who out there who's like thinking they should start something or do something and maybe later on in their life maybe like yeah just get out there do it like look don't procrastinate don't like fuck around with it like yeah have the balls go out there do it make it happen look steve he's like living proof of this at this present time and i expect to see greater things from him in the near future uh like the living embodiment of a swan as i said earlier in this busy kicking away but yeah steve one more time can you give people uh the sort of links where they can find uh like yeah for the 77 and like i will put the links uh in the description as well so yeah they won't miss out yeah i should have got a little crib sheet ready there shouldn't well, i so uh, well that's up yeah, to you <laughs> we are uh on twitter i think we are the 77 comic mm -hmm. uh on facebook it is the 77 uh, and there's a group and there's a uh, page. Uh, there is 1977 to 2000 AD for that nostalgia buzz. Mm -hmm. um, there is, I don't know, you can find me, Steve Ball, on Facebook. Uh, my Twitter account, I got two, but Fantasy Football Guys, FPL underscore bully. Um, and yeah, I'm sure we'll put everything else in the links on here anyway. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Uh, and thanks, thanks for having me on, me. Well, I don't know who wants to listen to me, but uh, it's been a pleasure. No problem. No problem. Okay. I'm. Yep. I'm gonna stop the recording. Wait one second. I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's uh, listened to the podcast so far. Uh, yeah. Thank you for anyone who's still here and staying. And I wish you a very great and awesome day. Remember, people, be awesome, be fantastic, be all the bees you can be. Hey. See you later. Peace. <laughs> yeah.